everybody. We have Jim Drew. He's, hey, he's going to talk about the history of uh, the world. Of the world? <laughs> he's going to talk about uh, various historical things in the Pacific Northwest and maybe beyond. Who knows? Okay, take it away, Jim. History of the world. First the dinosaurs came. Actually, the earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came. Then the, the Arabs came, took the oil. <laughs> so First there was light. You're, that's true. Okay, so everybody knows pretty much who I am, right? Anybody not know? People have been here before? Uh, there are new people here. Okay, new people. I'm Jim Drew. I spent um, 25, 30 years doing programming for mostly for Commodore stuff, designing hardware. I worked for Commodore for uh, probably six or eight months in the education division. <coughs> In Portland, Oregon, uh, there's a business called Computron Business Systems in downtown Portland. It was uh, the education center for Commodore for the Northwest, and it was also um, the service center for Commodore for Northwest. So if you got a drive that was out of alignment, it went there typically in the Northwest. So basically what I brought this year, instead of having you know, conversations about what I've done in the past, I brought a bunch of history of various things that I have found that I either was involved with as a project or used as a project or it was a competing product against me that I had to compare stuff. So I basically just got a few things to show. First of all, when I, um, I left high school, um, I graduated and I moved to Hawaii and I spent time there. And I came back to the mainland because I didn't like Hawaii. It rains too much. So I came back and moved to Portland. Which, <laughs> which is about, about half as much rain, which is kind of funny. So um, there's a company that was called um, their main products called Datapan. You may know what those are. They're expansions devices for the 64 and for the Vic 20. So I worked with that company in Portland, and this was the very first product that I actually worked on and released. And I found this on eBay about six months ago, and I was absolutely ecstatic. You know, when you bid on eBay stuff, you just want to wait to the end. I'm like, uh, -uh I'm bidding right right now. I'm like bidding as fast as I could. So this device is pretty rare um, because you notice it's got a Commodore 64 cartridge port. It's got a VIC-20 port as well, but it plugs into your 64, and this is a cartridge copier and a playback device. So one of the things they used to do as a trick for the cartridges is they go, they poke the, uh, the uh, bank select register at 01 to basically turn the ROM on and off over top of your RAM. And also, if you write to the area, you actually write over top of your cartridge or write over top of your game program. So one of the protections they used in cartridges was to write to a location in the cartridge memory and then go back and read it and see if it changed. And if it changed, they know it was coming out of RAM. So then they wouldn't make the, the program work. So what this did to get rid of that is that you plugged in a 16K VIC-20 RAM expansion into this slot and you plug your cartridge into here. You dump your cartridge to disk, take your cartridge, take it back to Toys R Us, and uh, <laughs> then you would load the image into the, the, uh, six, the 16K RAM cartridge for your VIC, and you would write protect it, and push the reset button, and boomo, now you got your cartridge you can play. And it works on all the cartridges until we started having banks like cartridges later on in life. But this was designed in, I think it says 1983 from Computron Business Systems. So this was the very first thing I had worked on when I came back from the mainland. Prior to that, I worked on pet stuff. And I did, you know, 64 stuff when I was in high school but this was the actual real first big product that I had worked with. So I actually found one, I was thrilled. Why did they use uh, VIC-20 cartridges? Because it stores, because we didn't have a RAM cartridge for the 64. Oh, okay. So you, we had a RAM cartridge for the VIC-20. You just pop it in there, you load it in there, you right protect the cartridge, and now it works just like it was a regular cartridge. So, are you gonna start making replicas, Jim? Make, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, okay, so after I had done, I worked with Computron, and it was pretty obvious I needed to do copy software and stuff because that was where I was headed. And Computron was actually very supportive of that. So I left the Commodore part of Computron and did my own stuff. And I actually used the offices at Computron for my office for a long time, uh, probably for about a year. And then so what I ended up doing was making my own company. Um, first, it was called Underwear. Yeah, my wife just found that out today, <laughs> and it was uh, you know under with W A R E, which is like, and it was short or uh, crunch for underground software. That's what it was for. And so we made a few different products. One of them was called Echo, and Echo was the very first 8K RAM expansion for a disk drive. And I actually have the original prototypes that I made. 
and I've got a couple of incarnations. First of all, this is an actual prototype, and uh, you can see it's a uh, hand wire jobby, and there was a lot of wires. There's actually clip leads that are missing off this board. I'm not sure where they went. So then we go from this transition to where is the board? To here. This is an actual. Then I'll rip the clip lead off. This is an actual production board. How it ended up being when I was done. So everything that I've ever made, I've always kept the original handwritten or wired wrapped prototype for, and then now later in the days I keep the circuit boards. But I have prototypes like this for everything I've ever done. Like this is an Amiga Blue Drive selector. Um, this is part of what was called Sybil, which we used back in the day for uh, copying discs on the Amiga. So basically I've kept every single thing I've ever made for whatever reason. Um, and the incarnations I've done, it's, it's pretty funny. This is a hand-wired job here of the boot drive selector. And that's the prototype circuit board. And then the production circuit boards were actually a different color. They were like a tan. So these are basically prototype, pre-production, and then we got a production. So pretty much that's how I did all my work back in the day. But I found boxes of all these old trinkets and stuff. So one of the other products that I had done besides Echo at Underwear was I made this product called X-Ray, and we sold 50, probably about 50 of them. And this is an actual original what we sold. And what this is, it's got some clip leads on it. This gave you the density of the drive and the, uh, the step, if you're on a half track or not. And so these were too expensive. We actually were losing money on it every time we sold one of these. So because the clip leads were extremely expensive to buy these. So I happened to find an original one that was a pre-production or actual production unit that we used. Not very glamorous looking because it's just a circuit board shoved in through some plastic that we bent over with a torch and so that's, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So later on in life, um, I made a company that was called Final Source Software and we released top secret stuff and a bunch of different programs. Now, Back in the day, we had the big craze with a game called Space Taxi because it actually had voice in it. Like, you know. So this is a Kovacs Voice Voicemaster. And I worked with these guys in Eugene, Oregon to make the software better for doing some of our filtering. And so if you ever boot up the program Top Secret Stuff, one or two, which is what I wrote, this is the actual box that I recorded my voice into. So every time you boot it up, it says, welcome to Top Secret Stuff. Ooh. So I had found that in my little collection of goodies. Um, I had to check out my competitors all the time. And so I've got things like an original Dolphin DOS. I've got a 1541 Express. For, these are copy things. The Clone Buster, which was a cartridge copier. So I, these are the things that I had collected and you don't ever see hardly these things anymore. I was a big fan of the pet. I started out, I was telling Leonard, um, my dad, who's a museum curator and director, got one of the very first pets right after CES. And it was sent to me, and I was 11 years old, I guess, at the time. And so my dad said, here, learn how to program this. You're going to write a program to handle a million items in the museum on an 8K pet on a cassette tape. <laughs> so imagine my surprise when um, it was not very possible, but you could make a good Pac-Man clone for sure. You know, I learned how to program on that. There was no manual for it at all because they didn't have a manual yet. I had the, remember the cassette tape called Time and Squiggle? for the pet. That was the very first tapes that came with it. So by looking at the listing file, I was able to figure out how basic programming worked. So about six years ago, seven years ago, I have, by the way, the original pet still from 1977. And I have five of its brothers as well. So I have three blue face pets and three normal pets. And they're all the 8K chiclet keyboard style. But you know, typically, if you take a look at some of the, the pets here, you'll see the return keys wiped out, the space bar, like that. So about six years ago, I happened to be surfing eBay, and I found a brand new, in the package, never been opened, original chiclet keyboard, replacement keyboard. So, so that's one of the things that I, and I'll never open it probably, you know, but it's, it's pretty cool. How much are raffle tickets for those? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Things we had to collect because we were doing a lot of uh, data transfers. Everybody's seen these before, right? This is the very first week that Jameco released this. This is an RS-232 interface for the 64. 
Jameco? Yeah, from Jameco. Oh. Okay. Yep, Jameco Electronics. Everybody knows yeah, Jameco? Yeah, yeah, Jameco. Yeah. yeah. So this was for 64. Huh. And so this came out, you know, in I don't know, probably 85, 86, something like that. So they actually had this available. And this is how we were able to talk to real modems and re do real data transfer. We were, so we were doing networking back in the day using a couple of these put together with a null modem cable. Let's see, what else goodies we got here? Um, I also, besides computers, I'm a huge, huge RC guy. Um, I fly radio control airplanes. I fly UAVs. That's what I actually do for a living now is I design flight control systems for UAVs and do stuff for military and things like that. So back in the day, this is what I used to practice oh, yeah. on. Everybody seen this? Uh -huh. Dave Brown's flight simulator for the 64. So this is the original one from back in the day that I used. Yes. Dave, is that the airplane one or the helicopter one? This would be the, I got both discs. This is the helicopter one though. What? The yeah. rare, I have a person looking for the helicopter one. I'll need yeah. a copy. <laughs> See that? RC helicopter. Ooh. <laughs> so I got the manuals and the whole nine yards for it, but that's just what I used to pass my time with. Instead of playing Jumpman, um, I used to fly on a really crude fly simulator. Now our fly simulators are great. Um, I spent a lot of time in simulators as a kid. My, I lived on a military air base in Klamath Falls, Oregon where I grew up from, and uh, so I have like about 2,000 hours on an F4 sim, and then I worked with uh, McDonnell Douglas for um, working on the simulator for the F-18, so I spent about probably 2,000 hours in simulation time on an F-18, and I am not a pilot, real pilot at all, oh. because you can't get me to go on an airplane. <laughs> I can't stand airplanes. John? <laughs> What's that? You can't stand airplanes. <laughs> John's, a, John's a pilot. <laughs> Yeah, I have a fear of flying. Everybody know what this is? Commodore? Uh, this is yes, this is the old one. Yeah, this is a silver label um, Commodore. This apparently, from what we can determine on the 64 uh, registry, this is the seventh oldest one that's been known registered. Its serial number is 2126. And these two guys named Bill Hurd and Leonard uh, <laughs> signed it for me today. So, <laughs> so this is a. Um, well, um, I got this later, uh, probably, I don't know how many years ago, a while ago. My original 64 I still have that I programmed with before I switched over to the uh, stolen 128. My space bar is uh, like this. Oh, wow. And it's all worn out. I got keys that are worn out. They say you can't wear out keys. You can wear out keys for sure. But I spent, you know, thousands and thousands of hours Ooh. programming on this stuff. The, the 128D that I have that uh, uh, Bill talked about briefly, that was stolen off of Dave Haney's desk. Um, I have a pretty good rapport with Commodore. I still have a license to use the 1541 drive ROMs for that from Commodore. I still have the certificate for it from Commodore. So, okay, Mike bought you a from Claude. Yep, I'll have to talk to you about it, yeah. So, so I can make the 1541 ROMs because I made, actually we got licensed to use the 64 ROM as well. Because I, I did a program called Magnum Load. Do you remember that? Okay. I've heard. Of it. Right. So Magnum Load I did, and that was a 64 replacement ROM, and that had the fast loader built into it in a wedge. They also made a thing called Turbo ROM, which was for 1541, and that gave you fast format when you did N0 instead of regular format, and sped up the head step rate, and a bunch of different little things it fixed. So those two ROMs that Commodore gave us for the blessing gave us the license to use it. It's like the um, a couple other things that we had licensed from Commodore for some of their hardware. Um, so. I would, basically what happened is that I got really good rapport with Commodore because I worked there for you know for a while in the education division and I call them up and I would talk to the guys periodically I say look I need a 128 I know you're coming out with this machine because I really want to support this machine with my copy programs and so about a week later I get a box with a 128 in it no 128 box and if you take a look at this computer where is it it's down here thank you so I added the extra box, but this computer says, you can get a close up on this here, okay, we'll zoom this in. is right, zoom can you read that Robert? Zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and trying to autofocus, got it. Okay, what's it say Robert? It says this device is not has not been approved by the federal government, <laughs> the federal communications commission. This device is not and may not be uh, offered for sale or lease or sold or or what leased 
until the appro approval of the FCC has been obtained. Right. The very top of it says property of Commodore. Oh, there it is. Yeah, property of Commodore. <laughs> yeah. Not so for sale. the story is that they went into Dave Haney's office. And this is one of the, Bill looked at the board earlier. He said, oh yeah, this is one of the early ones because it's got jumper wires and stuff. And uh, basically they stole it off his desk and they sent it to me. So at the World of Commodore show in 1994, I happened to have a booth there because we had released a product that was called, da -da -da -da. Uh -oh. can I hold that a second? It's wider than my, my camera. That's okay. <laughs> we'll scroll it, how's that? Scroll <laughs> That was called? There it is, yes, implant. It's called implant. And um, if you're familiar with what this was, yeah. this was a piece of hardware I designed for the Amiga that lets you emulate Macintosh, PC, and all stuff on your Amiga. So at this show, I, I talked with Dave Haney basically for the very first time. And so I said, hey, you know, I've got this 128 that um, got sent from Commodore, and it was, I had heard through the grapevine that it was removed from somebody's desk, and he's like, that's where that went. <laughs> so he was able to confirm, <laughs> confirm that's where it went. So that's how I ended up getting my 128, was basically courtesy of Commodore. So Bill and I figured out today that I probably got it between four and six months before anybody else. So that gave me a huge jump on the competition because my disc copiers had a 128 mode before the 128 was available. Wow. <laughs> Which was a good thing for me. Okay, so some other history things I got in here. I've got these. These are the Northwest User's Guide. This was the, basically in Portland in the surrounding areas. These were a couple of our newsletters that we had. And if you take a look at these, you're going to look at the club listing, and you're going to find Computron Business Systems and my name and the phone number in it, actually. So don't call it. It's not me anymore there. <laughs> so these were the guides. And so I guess we need to scan these, and uh, that way we've got copies of them. I have probably 20 more of these from um, 80, these are 84. Uh, all the way through probably 86 or 87. And back in the day, people that aren't old enough to know this, we used to have pizza parties. Remember the pizza parties? And they were basically were just a big copy session. Everybody had been bringing their, their drives and <laughs> So that was our thing. Pizza companies loved it, like uh, Shakey's Pizza and Pizza Factory and all those back in, in the day. Uh, Oregon Grinder, oh, yeah. yeah. Oregon Grinder back before Oregon Grinder was removed. <laughs> okay, what else the goodies I got in here? Um, things that I use for testing various things. Um, you may I remember this one? Oh, yes. The Z80 yeah, cartridge with a 80 uh -huh. column display yeah, yeah, and all yeah. this stuff. So I just been experimenting with this. I was going to release a, a couple of different programs for this. Oh. It never happened because oh. this wasn't a very popular item. Okay. And uh, I use this quite oh, yeah. a bit uh -huh. for doing yeah, programming yeah. because uh -huh. I got tired of seeing a 40 column display. Mm -hmm. So yeah. nowadays I use CBM Program Studio to do uh, software. Uh, what's it? Oh, this. Yeah, this last thing I'm going to show. So, back in the day, when we were doing copy protection, trying to figure out what it was, we needed to know what track things were on. And um, so, this is something I had found that I had not seen in a very, very long time. This is actually is the very first track and sector density, drive switch, right protect bypass, the whole nine yard box that we made. This was called a super tracker. And so this actually is a real working one. It's got a cable and the whole nine yards. And you connect all these wires to various places on the VIAs inside the drive. And it would give you a digital track display, density display, and then so you could see the head step of where you're going. Now, a lot of programs are super duper fast. So we learned really early on that you needed to have a VCR with a camera. And we used to record the head stepping of like accolade programs that were really fast. So we could see exactly what step what heads they went to you know, for different tracks, and uh, so this was we sold quite a few of these, and until probably about a month ago on Lemon, somebody has one and posted a picture of it. So I'm thinking, oh, I, God, I'd love to have one of those again, you know, because it's for nostalgia. And so I found in my storage, I found three of them, and I found them changed and unchanged. There was a bug, oh. and the bug is pretty subtle. If you take a look here, you can see some numbers. There's some numbers in there. Numbers. It okay, yes, one, I see numbers. Okay, one, two, three, four. Yes. How about this one? What do you see on that one? I see no, no numbers. Right, because what we did, we put we silk screened it. Because I was always saying, this is density one, this is density two, density three, and density four. Well, these were labeled backwards. 
So I wouldn't wouldn't want to change my how I handled things and all of my software for years. So we went ahead and just put a label over it. And then I've got another one I didn't bring with me. It's got Dynamo numbers on it, you know, which are huge and ugly. Right. So, but if you wanted to be figuring out what was going on for cop protection, you really didn't know where the head was stepping in what, um, you know, in half tracks, full tracks, like Batty Bob Strikes Back. That game drove me nuts. That took probably uh -huh. almost a year to make a copy program for that. But then other companies, Yours was the first company to build so a track uh, yep. track reader like that. Uh -huh. But then other companies jumped on board, right? Yes, they did. In fact, uh, I've got this called Trackmaster, <laughs> my competitor. Track <laughs> so, and this was made. I don't remember who by uh, George Allen. And so, basically, this is documentation on how to install. And the reason I kept this is because I used it as a reference for my documentation okay. about because I didn't have one of the boards my documentation this guy had. There's a long board, a short board, and a, another oddball board. So the, the uh, VIA connections are different locations. So I remember actually using this data for my product back in the day. So, but it shows you all the information about this and like where to put them on different boards and all this stuff. So yeah, there was a couple of different people that did it after we did it. And then when I got into the Amiga market, I made I found one for the Amiga that I had done as well. I don't have the plexiglass display anymore, but it used to have a plexiglass like smoke display, so it looked cool. And you just plug this into your Amiga drive port, and at that point it gives you uh, the head number, top or bottom head, and then the, the track. So, but we needed this for cop protection as well. So I don't think there's anything else in here like my little goodie bag that I brought. Just, oh, CPM cartridge. This one actually oh, yeah. works. <laughs> And I got CPM disc, original disc. Oh, my competitors. Here's a 21 second backup original oh, okay. cable system. I have an original 2.0 and original 4.1. And I, last year, or a little after, probably a year and a half ago, I uh, figured out how to copy that after 25 years. Uh -huh. And that's, uh, they use a protection scheme that uh, nobody should in the right mind should ever use. <laughs> you can't duplicate it with CrowdFlux or my uh, SuperGuard Pro. You have to have a 1541. Not a 41C, and not a 41-2. Uh, basically, what it is is it's called spiral tracking. And what they've done is they went from track, they read track 10, 10 and a half, 11, 10 and a half, 10, and they do this little thing like this. And so as the head steps, they're still reading data. There's no settling time. So it's looking for the data to transition as it steps across between the next track. And uh, that's really just a dumb way of doing it. But it's really weird. It's real reliable. I've never seen any failures at all loading on a 1541. But does it work with other 1541 drives on that kind of disk? What do you mean, the like, protection like, or? No, well, when you try and uh, load on a, a 1541-2. It doesn't work. Oh. Two reasons. One, the head step speed of the mechanics are different. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have the same transition speed anymore. Okay. And two, they actually use the ROM. Pretty weird. If you look at the, their code in the, the wrote, um, back in the day, Charles LeBorn wrote it. He actually uses a huge section of the ROM and the exclusive board is the ROM bytes together. And that's how he builds the GCR that he looks for as a pattern. <laughs> so if you don't have that exact ROM, it will load. But besides that, I took a 1541-2 me mechanics, rewired it, plugged it into the 1541. It still doesn't work because of the transition speeds different between the, 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 the uh, tracks and the steps. So I think that's it. That's just basically a little bit of history that I brought that I had found that was kind of fun. Um, things that I've worked on or had to deal with a period of time, and that's about it. Any questions about anything at all? Nothing? Yeah. AJ, what? Um, when did you when did you go, what time period did you go deep into the, um, into the, the data pulse analysis of this? Was that like 83, 84? I showed John, where's John at? Was that, John's gone. I showed John, um, schematics last year. I brought a whole big bundle of schematics that I had done for all the different products. And in early 1984, I actually had, for the, the 64 market, a flux copier, the very first one. The problem with it is it required two disk drives. And back then, disk drives were, what, 399 bucks a piece? Yeah. Nobody had two disk drives. So the market was so limited, we decided not to release it. But that's when I started getting into exact transitions of of the flux. And it was the data pulse that 
copy. Well, actually, on that case, what I, I did, I cheated. If you take a look at the, uh, the schematic of the 1541, it has a read circuit and it has a write circuit. And so basically, I recreated the write circuit exactly from the 1541, and I placed it on the board for the other drive, so the, basically the, the slave drive. So the master just basically, I clipped on to the read output pulse, and I turned on the write output pulse, and so it, when you hit the, the, the switch, it would basically spool exactly the, that data. And the only trick you had to do is make sure that you, when you turned off the writing, it was in the middle of a gap so you didn't smear valid data. But I remember the very first time that uh, Steve Byrne, which is my partner back then, we designed this little piece of hardware. The first time, we, I turned it on, and we just simply loaded a disk and pulled it out, and it copied onto the other one by simply loading it, because all it's doing is spinning the, the RP, it's, it's basically writing data over and over and over again. So it actually loaded the directory when we pulled the disk out. We're like, wow, this is great. So then we tried another disk, and it had an error 23, because the write splice, when it shut off, had to be right in the middle of one of the sectors that it uses for the directory. So I'm like, ah, okay, so I gotta figure out a way to synchronize this so that when we shut off the write, it's somewhere where we don't need that data. So that's to answer your question, that's how long ago it was. I started, Fantastic. yeah, a, lot, a little while ago. Anything else, anybody? Well, thanks, Robert. For thanks, Jim. Thank you. Absolutely.